Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to the Occult Explorers. I'm Snappy, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Dion. How are you doing, Dion? Life is good. Life is good. So we're back with part six of our entheogenic husbandry episode. So to start this episode out, we really got to give some trigger warnings today. We didn't do that last episode, and I want to make sure that everyone understands today we're getting into the dirt and the filth. We're going to be going to some weird and interesting places. There is going to be, um, well, Dion, what do you what do you expect to see in terms of the the weirdness today? Oh, body parts, body fluids, taboo subjects. You know, it's exactly. not too late to turn back. Turn back. <laughs> And always, we're here to remind you, we are about exploring ideas. The topic of this episode is husbandry. We're specifically focused on husbandry. And today, it's all about the birds and the bees. So why don't you, Dion, give us kind of an overview of from last episode to this episode? Well, and what you look, plan to get into. Yeah, yeah. Um, birds and bees, you know, and, and animals. We're compartmentalized from animals. You know, the food chain, it's far removed. So all this stuff sounds very wild. But in ancient times, this would be very normal. Like, do you wear leather pants? No. The average person doesn't wear leather pants, but in ancient times, you'd have leather clothing. You know, um, your fuel source, do you use electricity? In ancient times, you might use cow dung. Such you, know, a good you have a car? Well, in ancient times, you had a horsey. So the relationship with animals is far different than today. First of all, and then in terms of husbandry and theogenic husbandry, that's, you know, cultivating animals for specific results. Like domestication, making an animal softer, nicer. You know, more more qualities of uh, kin to humans. Or in there's some parts of husbandry, you can make the venom stronger, make the horse go faster, you know, make something jump higher, make dogs sniff a certain thing. Like how dogs are bred to sniff drugs, to find bombs. You know, that's what husbandry is to us. And in ancient times, it was everything. It was what is, it's what was programmable along with mother nature. You know, there wasn't computers, there wasn't machines. It was organic. And so animals were your computer, were your machine. That's such you know? a good point. And it's all of these things. It's also plants too, right? We even know that a lot of these, even before the Bronze Age, Stone Age peoples, right, were we're doing things to the to the forest and the trees. Like we used to have this uh, misconception that a lot of the woods around North America, you know, weren't were, were naturally occurring things. But these were all sacred groves that indigenous peoples had purposefully planted. And if you go, like you can find, there's a couple of these forests near where I live where they've maintained, like there hasn't been outside intervention since the time when indigenous people were predominant and you can go there and these these forests will produce abundant food sources at all times of the year that's by design you know these people were so much more connected to the land and to the animals than than we can imagine oh yeah oh yeah um excuse me two works come to mind automatically virgil's the bees and astrophonies, uh, what the birds? We yeah. talked about that before in a uh, city Dionysica, which was the event that they would they held once a year, and uh, they would perform a, a plays and slaughter goats, and drink a lot of wine, have orgies, and one year they took second place was the birds, you know. That was their version of Broadway, going to Broadway. And that was the topic. That was their topics. They're talking about animal topics. You That's know? such a good point, right? This this kind of these animals and everything are so essential to everything. And we got to remember that the theater at this time, even comedy like Aristophanes, 
is all about the mystery rights. It's all about, it's, it's this mass incorporation. And it's about like the Dionysica festivals, right? Where this revitalization of the polis, of the city, where the community came together in order to reaffirm their unity and their direction and to be a, a more loving and centered community. And comedy is a way to address issues, right? You could attack politicians. You can make fun of your circumstances. You could transform the, what you were hurt from into something pleasurable. You know, this is a magic of Dionysus. You laugh in the face of danger. You laugh at the absurdity of life. You laugh at death, right? Mm. It makes that it less true. painful. You and know, birds, uh, boy, birds are all about augury, aren't they not? <laughs> in Greek, in the Greek world, fortune telling. Exactly. If it flies left, it means this. If it flies to the right, it means something else. You know, so much of those ancient myths, right? They're about this idea of ascending the holy mountain, you know? Uh, and the holy mountain is the goddess Rhea, is the great mother Sibylle. You know, Dionysus is her, is her child and is the trees that point up and lift you up to the mountain. The birds are special because the birds can fly to the top and they could show you the way how to get to the top of the mountain. This is metaphorical, but it's also literal. This is why a guy like Tiresias, one of the greatest magicians of the Greek stories, transforms into a bird, into an egret. Mm. There you go. You know, and mind you, I would like to put this out. A lot of what we're talking could be astro theology. We don't get it. We don't get a lot into that in our videos, but we but we eventually will. What we're talking about now is the practical applica application of mythology through husbandry and plants and herbs. And so let's go to the first pick. Right. You know, um, we go. we're going to bring up a myth that we talk about in a lot of episodes: Zeus getting fed goat milk by Alamedea. You know? But there's more to the story. And I always think of just goat milk, goat milk, goat milk. What about the honey that goes in the goat milk from Melissa? That's a whole right. that's a whole other part of the myth. You know, it there's this down for me, Dion. Well, the word Melissa, um, B. You know, um B priestesses of the Melissa. You know, in ancient times, even there's there's a, a form of uh, Zeus, which is Mela Zeus, the bee man. Wild. You know, I might not be might not be saying it correctly, but hey, there you go. You know, so Zeus is fed off uh, goat's milk and honey, and protected by Melissa, and eventually, this term they become priestesses, called the Melissae. You know, um, let's hit the next pick. You know, here's one of these bee goddesses right there. Beautiful. That they found one of these, um, a golden plaque. You know, very ancient. Bees Where's are this very ancient? This, this is a Greek one. This is, I think, from one of the, I think that's from Crete or Manon. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um. So in terms of the bees and B, the ancient stuff, let's hit the next pick. I want to show you one of these tombs. This is a bee tomb. And we have a lot of pictures today. That's why we're going to go fast. And plus we have Almond joining us. These are special tombs that around the world have found that royalties are buried in, which are like a beehive. Oh, what do you mean? Yeah, the, the special bee tombs, you know, and they're used for ritual purposes as well. Um, Hit the next pick at that silly castle, Himmler's castle, you know, where they did doing all that <laughs> stuff. They have one of those. They have a beehive there. And this is wow. the beehive where they do the rituals in. You see on the ceiling, it has a swastika. And even the little placard says, based on the ancient Greek beehive tombs. That's wild. Yeah, and no. this is where they were doing some of their hoo-ha up in there. Because they... Uh, Posited that it has special properties. These beehive tombs, I think they're called thalos. You know, so let's let's hit the next pick. So another version of the Melissa are the oracles of Delphi. In the omphalos, the omphalos stone there, where the the methane gas comes out of or smoke, 
it has like bees around it. If you look close of what that is, those are like bees. That's so interesting. I never recognized that. For those who don't know, the Omphalos, that is the, you know, the castrated member of the god Uranos after Kronos slays him and divides uh, the world into three, into the heavens, the world, the earth, and the underworld. And that's yeah. what crashes to the ground. Ooh. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the Melissa, the, the Delphic priestesses would sit on tripods and inhale a form of gas, which we talked about. People in other videos say it's methane gas with cow dung, or there's methane gas coming out of the caves there. Or it correlates to smoking bees, which, I've, which I know you're familiar with. You see they put smoke in hives, the smoke right. that comes out of the hives, which we'll talk about later, get more into it. You know, and, and another thing with it is uh, Sybil, Sibeli, you know, from the Middle East. The Sibeli cults with the, the Galloway priests, you know, they have meteorites. And meteorites are also connected to bees as well. Interesting. And, and the Galloway and the Inari would wear saffron crocus colored robes, honey colored robes. And it deals with part of it. Deal, it does deal with the queen bee symbology. You know, even in these cults, the queen priestess, they would kill the male after a, a mating ceremony, just like a queen bee does. So with the queen bee, after she mates with the drone, as he's pulling out, she rips off his penis and he dies. Oh, wow. And some of these rituals are recreated in the castration ceremonies. And that's why the drones for the queen bee, for Aphrodite as well. Aphrodite has the, is, has Melissa priestess as well. And it's so the drone aspect, male drones that are castrated for the queen bee. <laughs> Love it. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, Aphrodite, and she's not only with bees, she has doves as well. We know a lot about the Aphrodite and the doves, but bees as well, the Melissa priestesses and her dove priestesses. Um, let's hit the next pick. Let's break down a little more of these doves in Zeus. Um, the Pleiadians. That's what doves, that's what the word means, doves. I didn't know that. The seven sisters, right? Yeah, up in the, the sky, yeah, in some versions. And they might spell it and put a P-E or a P-L-E. And the seven doves up there. And they're connected to a lot of hoo-ha and myths. We know these seven sisters. And what it, what it means is plenty of doves, like a flock, a plenty. And Zeus put them there. Uh, Beautiful. You know, go to the next pick. Yeah, the Pleiades, that's old stuff, too. We know that, like, some of the oldest myths, like the Austral, um, Australian indigenous peoples have deal with the Pleiades. And these are some of the oldest myths ever recorded. On know? the planet. On the planet. Yeah. You know, so here's uh, Hebe. And every morning, a group of doves, a plenty of doves, would bring ambrosia and nectar to her. And she would serve the gods in Olympias. You know, she's a cupbearer. Um, right. You know, you might have seen Ahmed's episode the other day talking about these nectars, the golden nectars. Hmm? Um, you know, part of the golden nectars, the that honeymead, speaking of the bees, the honeymead goes back before the, the wine rituals. You know, when we're talking about the... Because venting and wine is only exclusive to certain areas where bees are everywhere. It's an older mystery, this honey mead. That's such a good point. You know, we see some of these like honey. I remember there's honey beer that was brewed with spit in China. That's one of the oldest versions of any kind of alcoholic beverage we've, we've, we've discovered. And there's a lot of this kind of of stuff all over the world. This, this brewing of, of, of various honey drinks, wild yeah. stuff. You know, speaking of spitting, you know, in kava kava ceremonies in Hawaii, they spit the kava plant, the piper plant back into the bowl because of the rhizomes, it's the saliva, the enzymes in the saliva breaks down the rhizomes, making it bioactive. And then it ferments and then everyone drinks it and gets, it's actually called a hypnotic as its own category. 
Amazing. But, you know, so TB, um, nectar and ambrosia. Every every morning the doves would bring it because that's what the gods lived on. She has a brother. You know who her brother is? Hit the next Ganymede. page. <laughs> oh yeah, Ganymede, another cup bearer. You know, and Zeus turns into an eagle to seduce him and kidnap him. You know, just yeah. saying. <laughs> and in terms of the cup, am I allowed to tell you what kind of cup it is? You got to go there. An anal cup? Yeah. Wow. And part of the drink, they say it's green in the cup. But the plant starts off yellow tansy. It's a tansy plant. It's some of the bits. Just saying. You know, these cups. Um, it's pretty wild. You know, so speaking of these bees and nectars, ambrosia and nectar, there's another god that lives off of ambrosia and nectar, the god of beekeeping. Oh, really? Who's this? Ariastus. How, uh, Ar Am I saying his name right? Ariastus? Yeah, Ariastus. You know, my so. pronunciations are so bad. You know, yeah. he was a, a beekeeper, the god of beekeeping. Um, and he chased... Uh, Eurydice. Eurid Am I saying her name correctly? Eurydice. That one Eurydice. I know for sure. Eurydice. All right. I got something. Wrong. There you go. So he so chases you... her. The gods get mad and they kill his beehives. And this is the god of beekeeping. So he goes it's... to his mom and she tells him how to get it back. And she says, you have to slaughter cattle. And if you slaughter cattle, it'll the bees will come back out of the cows. That's so interesting. And so yeah. this is an ancient myth that um, becomes ceremonial and ritualized in ancient Europe. They called it Bugonia. And there's even lots of different manuscripts where they show you, you know, you, you kill a cow and you wait a certain time. And supposedly the, the bees are going to come out. There's going to be honey nectar. Now, there is some truth to this because there is some bees that do this. There are vulture bees that live off a, a carcass, rotting flesh. They're attracted to the smell of it. And people thought it was psychoactive. They're, atta they're attached, they're attracted to the proteins and the decaying flesh. You know, some wasps do it too. And so they would set up a, a nest in there, but not your regular honeybee. But what does do it is a hoverfly. But you know how fly you see flies off of dead carcasses. And there's a certain type of fly, the hoverfly, it actually pollinates flowers. Hence the bee symbology. Interesting. Oh, wow. It makes you know, a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and in terms of this honey, you know, how you can get different forms of honey, because people wonder, is the is the honey that's in a dead carcass, is it edible to humans? You know, because honey can transform things. What happens, bees go to different plants and they bring it back. And, and go to the next pick. And we'll get into an example of that. And this, this is rhododendron. This is in Nepal. And they had it in Kolkis too, in Trabzon area. Trabzon Rees. By the Black Sea, they produced the mad honey as well, which turned out the Roman army in some mythologies. They ate too much of it. Yeah, what happens, the bees go up there and they, they get that rhododendron plant and then they form this honey that's called mad honey. Amazing. That's it, so it's, a, it's, it's a grain of toxin is what it, what's in it. So it ain't like DMT. It ain't like muscarol or it's a grain of toxin. It's of some, and it gets people high as a kite. Love it. <laughs> you know, and so there's other, there's other bee honeys that get people high. One is Heather in Scotland. You I know, remember we talking about this one. Yeah. The bees. Pollinate the heather plant, go back to the hive, and boom, you eat that honey, and whoop, 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 you know. And you can buy so, this stuff apparently still. It's quite expensive online, but. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so considering that the honey mead ritual is older than the, the wine Dionysic rituals, you know, it's. How can we say this, you know? Um, the, the honeymoon ritual and the illusion rites, you know, the kaikion <clears throat> had honey in it. 
Now, could the honey be this kind of honey? If they, if they had it in the Black Sea right there? You know, you got to think about it. In terms of husbandry, we're just looking at it as honey. Well, what a kind good of honey? chance. A spiced honey, a medicated honey, a fermented honey, you know. It's also important that we point out that with, Dion with Dionysus, he predates the wine symbolism. The wine symbolism comes after once winemaking comes out of Georgia. But he's attested to in the Linear B as Dionysus, the god of trees, which were any plant that pointed upwards. You know, so there's a lot more to him. And he was associated with madness, right? The wine kind of thing. There was a separate God. We'll have to ask Ammon, but there's a separate God for the directly for the wine. And he becomes associated with that because it becomes central to his rights. He's the dying and rising vine. But originally this was the tree. Oh, yeah. And bees, too, are part of the, the rituals, you know. Um, let's hit the next pick. So, Icarus. With his wax wings and his Yeah, beads wax. You know, and that's what I'm going to get to. Just to let you know, there's more than honey. There's propolis. There's beeswax. You know, there's jelly. jelly. There's, there's all, and we'll talk about some of the different ones, you know. Um, there's also bee venom. And bee venom is very popular. People use it for skin facial stuff. It's supposed to rejuvenate women's skin. It's very expensive. Interesting. Yeah, and so the myth with Icarus, he has a, he has his uh, fake wings. Well, they're wings from real real feathers, dove and falcon feathers, from what I understand, with beeswax, and he gets too close to the sun and it melts. It's the birds and the bees. Wow! Together, the birds and the bees allow him to fly to the heavens. Yeah, well, that's almost, some almost, almost. So almost. That next pick, right? Almost to the heavens. He doesn't have the passwords. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, there's some of the kike. I threw in a picture of the kike on. You know, honey based cheese, water, but penny royal or mint, um, and some type of honey. You know, it could be a special honey. That could have been where the powers, some of the powers, coming from, or ergotized. Uh, Wheats, which we'll talk about a little later, but yeah. So let's hit the next pick. Boom! I'm gonna get show you a little bit of apotherapy. Besides taking these bee products, that's uh people using the bee venom. Wild. Some people use it for arthritis, anti-inflammatory. Even though it's gonna inflame you, <laughs> but it's, it's used in different ways. It's very expensive. They collect it. It's used for skincare, needling. They do some type of needling in, in the skin. You know, we know that the Greeks were using all these kind of uh, poisons from these different uh, insects anyway. Right? There's all yeah. that talk of the gadfly, and that's related to the the Christing, the Christo, right? Getting stung by the gadfly, and that also has to do with the cows. So there's there's some direct connection here between this kind of gadfly driving the cow mad, and then the the cows producing bees. There's, there's some really interesting connections here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, um, this is the next pick. So ancient Egypt, a bee, this is the bee, a hieroglyph. Bees are so special in Egypt, ancient Egypt. And, you know, when they uh, went into King Tut's tomb, they found some jars that had a little bit of honey residue. And the honey was still good. You know, I remember reading that honey doesn't go bad if you if it, if it if it doesn't come in contact with something, you can preserve it in a jaw for for forever, basically. You know, Egypt was a very special manufacturer in ancient times of honey. They used to export it to the surrounding areas, and the honey was called the tears of Ra. Oh, beautiful! Yeah, yeah, and you know how the Egyptians. Matt, I worked with the bees. It was very special. You know, we're getting some real deep stuff here. Go to the, the next pick. All right. These are Egyptian beehives. They would make these and then seal them with beeswax at the ends. And they're removable. And they would take them up and down the Nile. And they would put them next to their favorite plants. Like acacia and Syrian rue, which is harmala, um, tamarisk, kermis. Uh, lotus, 
Papasia, different ones. And so <clears throat> they could they could control what type of honeys that the bees were making. And they even had a way to communicate with the bees. See now the queen bee, she she buzzes, but she does some other sounds it's called tooting. And the toot is at 450 hertz, which is almost A sharp, right around A sharp. And it's like a bzz, bzz, bzz. it's like a special it, and you can build a little instrument that copies that sound. So the beekeepers would talk to the queen bee and they would communicate when it was time to let the bees out. And then they would smoke the bees. Now they would use frankincense and cannabis. And part of it is it doesn't get the bees high. Part of it is does it block the pheromones that the bees are giving off, which you know. And another thing is when they're getting smoked, the bees eat a lot of honey, which gets them kind of high too and slows them down. And they become more docile. You know, that's called smoking the bees. But these are the movable hives that they would move up and down Egypt to control what type of honey you wanted. If you want psychedelic honeys, you know, um, let's go to the next six. Let's go to the next picture, you know, and so that's the smoking, you know, technique. It's a little thing and you just blow smoke into it, but there's different types of smoke. You know, like I'm saying, they were using frankincense or cannabis. You could use herbs to speed them up or slow them down. And by the <laughs> way, you know, beekeepers live longer. Oh, one reason being is that all right, the buzz of the bees gives off nitric oxide. Or how what it does is it stimulates nitric oxide production in your blood, as well as serotonin. That's so interesting. The, the frequency of the bzzz, and especially if they're up on you and they're friendly with you, they can show you love or hatred. You know, they could because the way the queen bee communicates, and so they would have these relationships with the queen bee. Using sound and herbs. That's so interesting. They're they're hot boxing themselves and they're hot boxing the bees, these Egyptians. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So let's get into the Egyptian uh, goddess of the bees. Go to the next pick, please. Um this is a nut or neat. Um here she is as, as an acacia tree. Beautiful. You know, she was the goddess of the bees, crocodiles, and acacia trees. And, you know, and the acacia tree is known as the tree of life in Egypt, where the gods come out of the acacia tree, including Horus and the other gods, which we'll talk about. You know, and there's something very special between crocodiles, acacia, and bees. So what's this connection? That's, right. That sounds so weird. It gets very complicated. So, the, so first of all, crocodiles hang out by acacia trees. And what they do is they attack the herbivores that are attacking the acacia tree. And they feed off them. And so the acacia tree provides them shade and animals to eat. And in return, they police the tree to keep it safe. Now, as well, on the tree is bees because bees are really drawn to acacia blossoms and bees are also drawn if you go to the next pick see and that's that's the nut right there you see two crocodiles she's nursing the crocodiles oh wow yeah 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 so hit, hit one more even boom all right so there's a bees right there feeding off crocodile tears they like crocodile tears Interesting. Yeah, there's a and, butterfly and a bee. Yeah, it, it, they get salts from it. And the crocodiles are at the acacia trees where the bees are getting the acacia blossoms. Now, there's also another animal involved, which is the ants. Ants are especially drawn to acacia trees and they have a symbiotic relationship. The acacia provides them compartments to nest and gives them a special sugar it excretes. And what the ant does is the ant in turn will will attack any herbivore that tries to eat from the tree, except for the bees, because it stops at the acacia blossom, the chemical production of this sugar for the ants so that they don't attack the blossom in the bees. Now, the relationship with the acacia tree in the ants is such that if it ha feels that there's a predator, 
it'll turn off the sugar production to the ants and give it a different chemical, making the ants go crazy and attack. Oh, and how do it know that there's a predator? Well, because it gets ethylene gas from the next acacia tree that signals it. And then they start producing tannins in the leaves. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I'm just saying, these acacia, acacia tree, these animals, are a lot more going on in Egypt. You know, and they knew this. And that's why they would make that spermicidal that we talked about in other episodes, where they get croc dung with honey in acacia. And the woman would put that in her vagina. And it would produce a certain alkalinity, a pH, and lactic acid in a sper as a spermicidal. You know, and this is the goddess yeah. new. And it deals with... No, and even Sobek, that's where they get the word anointing, the mesh on the feet, you know, the anointing, part of anointing, the feet is crocodile fat for Egyptian pharaohs, you know, you know, it's just, there's a lot of special stuff going on with the connection between these animals. You know, the other thing is honey and acacia are used for snake bites as well. You know, the honey is used for skin, antibiotic. And to, to, to seal the skin. And part of the techniques was spitting. You know, they could put the medicine on you, but they could, but the doctor could take the medicine in his mouth and spit it on you like the snake spit on you the first time. That's what that technique, yeah, it's called spitting. It's a technique of applying medicine. It's, you know, our spittle, where they put, you know, even like you've seen the episodes where all the times about putting the eyes rubbing the spittle on the eyes to heal the blind man. Right. You know, and another thing is honey in these herbs are used in circumcision. It's used to heal the wounds in circumcision, which is important because we'll talk about that later in later episodes. You know, this relationship between honey and body parts and wounds. You know, so let's hit the next bit. All right, so the mummies. All right, so in ancient times, we talked about Anubis, funerary rites, the god of mummification. Part of his tools were honey and acacia. <clears throat> acacia makes gum resin, which is famous for incense and for putting badges together, the sindons, and honey. Soaking bandages in honey, which become a crocus color, or putting honey on the skin before you mummify because what? It's a preservative. It makes it last forever. And Amazing. So, this is called mellified man, mellification process. The mellification process is such. Before your death, if you want to, if you were going to do it, a, a self-induced mellification, you start fasting on honey. And you only bathe in honey until you die. And then after that, they mummify you in pure honey in a vat in a stone chamber. After so many years, you turn into a confection that they would eat. Not mummia, like where they would take the wraps, you know, in ancient times or the turn of the century. You know, they were taking mummies and grinding them up and snorting them or putting them into alcohol. But this is different. The whole thing becomes like a confection, a honey confection that's sweet. This makes me think of you telling us those stories in earlier episodes about them eating those little figures of Osiris, making those honey cakes. Yeah. You know, and they also make these other cakes too, uh, Lazaricos, little Lazarus cakes, which is also another mummy. They do that in the Greek tradition. You know, oh, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and speaking of honey with the Greek tradition, I didn't even tell you about the cave Mount Ida and Cave Ida on Aunt Crate. Um, that's the cave where Zeus went to be nursed on honey. It's called the Cave of Bees. Well, in the island's Easter celebrations, they go to that Cave of Honey or the Cave of Bees for the Easter celebration on the island of Crete. You know, the Melissa Cave. Um, so let's hit the next pick. All right, so Horus, the hawk, the falcon. Um, what does he like? What does he like to eat? What do falcons want to eat? Doves. They also like honey. And so they would offer doves, dove sacrifices and honey to Horus, who some That's people posit is Jesus in some mythologies. You could, you could type in on YouTube, Jesus Horus, and see a hundred videos pop up. 
the different symbolisms and connections. Um, and Horus, we know how Horus uh, subdued his uncle Seth, the donkey. You know, he'd wrestle with them and, until finally he had to put some of his semen on some lettuce and trick him to eat it. You know, that, that's how he calmed him down. You know, and so Horus is connected to falcons. Some people say Jesus. To doves, because that's what they like to eat. And to honey. And also to acacia trees, because he's born from an acacia tree. You know, and you'll see some pictures of him standing on top of Sobek. Remember, I showed you a, a picture in the last episode of Hermanubis that where well, they're standing on top of Sobek. Right. You know, in some of his versions, you've heard of the, the left and right eye of Horus. Yeah, yeah you know, for sure. And some of the moon. left eye of Horus has a bee in it. Oh, really? Yeah. Excuse yeah. Me. You know, and so I want to explain a little more about the um, another myth with Horus in the reeds. So in some myths, um, he's bit by a snake in the field of reeds. And so when he's healed, they use Horus as one of the um, gods for snake bites because of uh, he was he almost died from a snake. And they originally thought it was Seth that did it. And they were going to go get Seth. Like, oh, Seth got him because they found him almost dead in the reeds. And it turns out it was a, a snake that got him. You know, and in another myth, the world is dark, the abyss, a moon. And there's a singular reed, and Horus lands on it, and then everything sprouts out from there. The reed in the water and Horus. I'm planting some seeds subconscious for later. But let's go to the next pick. Falconry. Training of the falcon. You know, it'll land on your arm, it'll go hunt and come back, and it'll go get some doves and hunting and come back. This is a picture, I think, a Mongolian uh, falconer. But this was big in Egypt. Like, if you're a pharaoh, that was mandatory. You know, really? Relationship with animals, birds and bees. You know? Yeah. And so, falcons liking doves and honey. And being next to Egypt there, we talk about the Holy Family in the past episode and some other episodes, going into Egypt and hanging out with the animal gods and having relationships with animal gods. And so now we'll explore some of that. You know, so let's go to the next pick. The land of milk and honey. Ashkelon. Israel, which we've talked about. In one episode, our Aphrodite episode, we talked about Semiramis. The myth of Semiramis. Who, um, it's uh, Dorsetto. Who comes from Lake Ashkelon, who's the Starbucks cup woman. With, you know, legs of a fish and a goddess on top of mermaid. Pisses off uh, Aphrodite. And then, so she has a baby and she has to hide the baby, you know, and the baby is Semiramis is fed by doves and taking care of doves. They keep the baby warm and they give the baby milk, you know, Interesting. and you wonder, well, where do they get the milk from? Get the next pick. It's called it's crop milk. Doves milk. We talked about this in the Ashkelon episode. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not them eating food and regurgitating it into them. They have special glands that secrete a type of milk into the baby doves. And so we, I started messing with the AI before and even more on this episode concerning the doves' milk on how to collect it. You massage them and how to give them certain high-protein diets. And um, you can collect it, you know. And why would you collect it, you ask? Well, they have an endocannabinoid system, so you could feed them hemp seed, and it produces... Uh, THC, if there's enough in it. And also, um, you can eat the meat. Like, so if you give them ergotized rye, the crop milk will produce LSA. That's what the AI said. And if you eat their meat, it'll have LSA in it. Now, mind you, in Ashkelon, Aphrodite, Urania, her, one of her outposts where doves are sacred, doves supposedly flew around the whole city. I think it was one of those Herodotus or Jophis, Josephus. One of them talks about. Doves were just everywhere. They were coming in and out of the houses, and you would eat them, sacrifice them to the gods. 
Well, we often forget just how important um, pigeons and doves were to to the ancients. You know, this is one of the earliest domesticated animals. And this is an animal that they're using for communication and as a food source. And they're so domesticated, like anyone who has experiences with pigeons nowadays will know that they don't build nests. They, 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 we've completely bred that skill out of them in order to house them in, in uh, our own sort of nest boxes. And this is a problem to this day. They'll just lay their eggs on the ground, you know, and now we treat them like rats when we did this to them. They were, they were so essential to, oh. to, to our early form of life. And now we've just abandoned them. It's, it's something that really depresses me. <laughs> well, we'll hit the next pick. I want to, that's it. Here's a columbarium, a dove cotes. This is an example of, all right, at Ashkelon, they found one. It didn't look like that. It was all, you know, it was the remnants, the ruins. But this is one they found in Iran. And these are all dove little coops, little chambers for them to, to nest. And so you can collect crops milk and LSA and opium and opiized milk from them and all kinds of things. Wow. You're saying, because how would you get enough of it? Well, that's how you'd get enough of it. The sheer and amount. They're there for sacrifices, though. In Ashkelon, they were part of sacrifices. They're a form of currency, just like the cat mummies and the dog mummies. Because they had dog uh, cemetery in Ashkelon with thousands of dogs there, as well as mollusk pits. You know, that's where they were doing the, the mollusk production as well in Ashkelon. And vineyards. And they had also beehives. You know, it was a popping little city at the time, the little horseshoe spot. You know, so, you know, there's another thing with doves that's special. Their pineal gland is photosensitive. Really? So it knows it changes season. It responds to light. Not just the, the light like that, but it knows the seasonal. It knows what's going on. That's beautiful. The pineal gland, it's photosensitive. It'll adjust to conditions. You know, and so hit the next pick. Boom. You know, I'll tell you one more thing, though, real quick, that doves do to get high. It's called ante. They roll They roll on the ground on an ant hive, their feathers, and then the ants try to sting the feathers, and it leaves an oil that gets them high. And it also protects the feathers. And then sometimes they'll just go ahead and eat the ants, too, for protein. It's called ante, and it gets birds high. I didn't know about the high part. I knew that they were doing that in order to protect themselves, but wow, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, not all birds, but doves do it. Morning doves. So um, in the Bible, there's a story of the doves in uh, the dove in Noah's Ark. Right. That, this is, this is a painting. That, yeah, this is a representation of the dove coming back and found land. They're so happy. You know, um, sailors and pirates could use doves like that or birds and send it out to see if it could find land. Which direction would it go to find land? That's a form of augury. Beautiful. You know, um, and these doves in the Bible, doves and honey. So let's explore some of that. Let's hit the next pick. So, Our man Samson, Heracles, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, even um, be in the Bible, Deborah, Deborah. You know the name Deborah? Yeah, what's with this name? That's B. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in the Bible. You know, and there's another story in the Bible. Even before we talk about Samson and, and getting honey off a lion, which reminds me of the Begonia stories from earlier, but there's a, there's a story in the Bible where Jonathan eats honey and his eyes light up. I don't know if you remember that story from the Bible. Vaguely. Can you unpack this? What's going well, on there? He's not supposed to eat. And they, they put this dad puts out a uh, edict not to, to touch any certain types of foods. He doesn't know he gets some honeycomb, he eats it, and his eyes light up, and they know he ate the honey when he comes back. So what kind of honey was that? You yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, man. Huh? So let's talk about Samson's riddle. You know, uh, in you, judges. Heard, right? Yeah, yeah, you've heard about that riddle where supposedly he tears up a lion and then he eats some honey out of it and he comes back and he's going to marry a, a lady and 
he gives her all their people a riddle. They can solve the riddle, you know, and and eventually she gets the the she tricks him out of it and he tells her what it is. And that it's honey. But in some cases, it's not honey. It could be translated as venom or semen. Oh. Yeah. You know, and then he comes back and he says, You guys want to figure this out unless you plowed my heifer. That makes me think of that bovine episode. What was that goddess who climbs inside the heifer in order to to get to have to produce a stereon there? Wow. Yeah. And you know, and so Samson gets mad. He goes off to Ashkelon and kills 30, was it no 200, 200 people, 200 men, and brings back 200 outfits, brings back their clothing. You know, and that's almost reminds you of like the stories of where they go collect foreskins for days, right. you know, because that's a form of clothing, you know. But it's wild that this is that that myth of honey coming from a carcass. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I've even heard that in some maybe you came across this, but I heard that in some translations it's not a lion, it's a it's a it's a cow. Or bull, yeah. Well that and that's what it is with um Arestis. Right. Arestis is, is the bull, you know. And so there's some older mythologies going on here. All right, so let's go to the next pick. Talking about doves, you know, in Ashkelon, dove sacrifice. So when Jesus is a wee little lassie, they have to take him to the temple on the eighth day. And they have to take two doves because that's the that's part of the tradition. You got to go sacrifice two doves on the eighth day. You know, and another thing that they do on the eighth day as well is the circumcision. That's the eighth day thing is the circumcision. And they would use honey for the healing. But, all right, so let's hit the next pick. And he gets a little older. He has to be baptized. He gets naked with John, who likes to eat honey. Remember, he lives, this guy lives off honey and locusts. And he's baptized through the dove. Somehow the dove is part of it. Incredible. You know, remember they did dove sacrifices when he was eight, on his eighth day, as well as circumcision, you know. So this all keeps me thinking too of all of these great mother cults we see, right? Where you have all of this um, circumcision and then the honey, right? Like at the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, at Ephesus, right? She has all those beehives on her and testicles. There's this, there's this connection between that symbol symbolism, and then this is a form of divine imitation. And we know, like, and Jesus tells people to castrate themselves. And there, so there's a lot of speculation if he hadn't undergone this himself, if he wasn't one of the Galloi. Our, our producing Galloids to sell off to at the little pirate ports. Exactly. But, uh, next pick. So that's strange that they, they sacrificed two doves on the eighth day for him. There's all these doves when he's being baptized and doves here and there, but he gets mad and goes into the temple. He gets mad, kicks out the cattle and sheep. You know, which did, we talked about the bovine stuff, the opus bull, you know, and the doves, the doves of Aphrodite, you know, which uh, were the were the doves priestesses, young priestesses at that in the temple. You know, remember, th these are the priestesses of Aphrodite were called doves or Melissa, the bees. This is such a common thing, right? We got to remind ourselves that often. In the Greek, when they're talking of animals, they're talking of people. Even the mythological animals are talking people. When they're talking about dragons or sphinxes, or like you said, doves or bees, these are all human beings a lot of the time. And you know, it's wild. He has the ergosteri, the flail. Right. Which is used to correct the labdanum, the temple incense, and the goat's beard, as well as the flail, the flail is the sign, you know, the, the pharaohs there. And that's when he makes one of those. He, it says he makes one. He does a little shabari there and ties one up and boom, boom, boom. He's got his air to scary. I also noticed that there's a bull in this picture. Why is there a bull there? That's the happens <laughs> bull. No, it says it says that he gets rid of the bull and the sheep and then the doves. What's up with the doves? We'll talk about that a little later, obviously. 
But let's hit the next pick. We also know that the, the, the sheep is related to the snake venom, you know, because the sheep can be used in the same way a horse can, and it's even more successful at creating anti-venoms. Mm -hmm. so there's some weirdness going on there. And so here, um, crucifixion scene, ah, you had the Roman cohort there. And they used to drink something called Posca. That was the drink. They had a, they had a, a thousand deep Roman legion, at least. And part of their drink was sour wine. It's like a vinegar called Posca, you know, gall. And supposedly here on the, on the crucifix, they hand him a drink. Now, the way they handle the drink is using a, a sea sponge that's dipped in Posca and honey. Because Posca was sour wine vinegar with honey. And then into a sea sponge which is also medicated sometimes onto themselves in that reed, that high sop reed, which is used also for snake bites. And then what would happen is the liquid would go through the reed. Can you see that? And they would squeeze the sponge and you, 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 he's absorbing the liquid from the sponge through the reed. Now the falcon and the reed in the sea sponge and the snake is Horus, but okay. Snake bites. It's a remedy. The thing they're giving them, the gall, that sour vinegar. And the Roman Legion drank that. That was what their, was their backbone of what they drank every day. You know, it was like this sour wine. Vinegar with honey, maybe a little salt. You know, herbs. Wow. And so there's more to the story, though, that deals with the horse and the falcon and the reed and a lot of different things going on there. With, that deal with snake bite remedies. But yeah, so let's go to the next pick. Boom. So after the resurrection, they don't believe that he's really Jesus and he's, he's alive and back. So what do they make him do? Yes, eat fish and honey. That's the test. And the thing is, remember, we talked about Salema Sarpa, Orgi, which is off the coast of Israel, which at that certain time of year that this takes place, it's a lucigenic fish. It's so interesting. The dream fish, you know, in the okay. hunt. You know, just saying, that's what he had to do to prove to them, hey, you got to eat some dream fish and honey, and then we'll know you're real. Got to induce the mania. <laughs> yep, yep. Just saying. So next pick, please. Last pick, and then we'll, we'll bring on the doctor. Um, Here's Mary. Aphrodite with that dove and they're holding the, they're holding that crown for her as Jesus holding the crown for her so that the dove it deals with that energy you know here she's the central figure she's Aphrodite yeah this is Aphrodite Urania right the the yep. goddess of heaven and yep. th this is this it's like it's Christian but it's barely Christian this to me screams Greco-Roman with all of the cherubs, the, the, you know, the little Cupid angels and like, and the dove and, and, and sitting like that. And why if they're headless, that's John. Remember getting his head cut off and he would right. blow wind, the dance Ariel and those, and those in the back are her drones. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So the birds and the bees. It always connects, doesn't it? It always connects. All right, Dr. M, and if you're around, feel oh, free yeah. to come Please and join, join us. us. Please join us. We did. I did send him an email, so I wonder if he caught it. He may have gotten sidetracked, so we'll give him a minute here. But um, while we're waiting for the good doctor, let's talk a little bit more about some of this. Um, like, How do you connect all this together then? Like, what do you think is going on with a lot of this honey? Oh, here um, we go. Older tradition. Hey, hey, hey. You have summoned me. <laughs> Hello, our good friend, Ammon. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you for having me on. Um, delightful. Enjoyed your presentation thoroughly. Um, now, with the birds and the bees, I, of course, brought Sir Richard Burton and his gospel of cunnilingus i 
uh, I think that it, it fits perfectly with the honey that you guys are talking about. Um, uh, um, and I think it, it's a nice place for us to take up in a very academic way. Um, you know, you're talking about the doves, for example, and the bees. And every time you're saying dove or bee, my name is, my, these names in my mind are coming up of the actual priestesses. We've got two of these at the Oracle of Amun, right? These honey-producing priestesses. And um, I want to show you um, how that, how all of this pharmacology with the substances that we're all looking at, how it fits in to the oracular traditions, the oracular rite, the mystery. And it's not, it's not um, just as background. It's the focus of how we get, you know, if you don't have those doves, right? And they call them doves, right? In antiquity, look at the sources, right? The doves that went to the different oracles and what that was. And they'll tell you, you know, they're priestesses, right? And this is what they did. So we're looking at that. And that's why I wanted to bring in Priapeia. When you're talking about all this husbandry, right? You're talking about all this pharmacology that's going on. Um, all of this is within the college of these oracles. Um, so, you know, we might as well just see what they're what they're doing. But in order to get there, if I may, can I just read you something? Please do. This is exciting. So this is Sir Richard Burton, who was a um, who was a linguist, a, a cunning linguist um, <laughs> who did lots of who did lots of languages, including Greek and Latin. He wasn't just a classical linguist. Um, as far as we know, he had like 27 languages that he actively worked with. So, and he was brilliant, just an absolutely brilliant. He also wrote a history of flatulence that they wouldn't allow him to publish um, because it would, you know, taint his character. But, you know, he bucked the system a little bit and he translated all the priapeia. He gathered together all the priapeic poems. And he wrote this wonderful, these wonderful introductions to areas that you and I won't be able um, to experience in a university environment. We won't in the country that we're in. If we're, you know, modern Westerners, we won't be able to. But I want to read to you, and this is great scholarship, um, just about erotic classical writers. Did you know? that there are erotic classical writers? Well, sure, Elephantus was a licentious Greek poetess who wrote on the different modes of coition, you know, the different modes of coitus. In her work, which has perished, right? None of this survives. It is supposed that she enumerated nine postures of venery. Nine postures of venery. Yeah. And then he goes on to name author after author after author of unknown women, majority, overwhelming majority women. Through time, Greek and Roman sources who are writing material that has to do with collecting the honey that we're talking about. And they're all here. They're all here. I can give you names that no other classical author has ever heard of, right? No other classical um, scholar has heard of. I can name you off 20 names right now of incredibly important authors who just don't, didn't make it through the dark ages, right? We're having a request that you hold up the book so people can see it. Oh, this is just the... Uh, Richard Burton, right? the Priapeia, and in it they published, this publisher, published the, what is this, Cambridge? I don't know. Published the, uh, um, the appendices that he wrote. And I want to take you really quick, and I know you're like, what is the connection here with the birds and the bees? Trust me. Trust me, it's here. I wouldn't give you a hard time 
uh snappy you know that you know that well, but you, I know, to... you always bring the goods Ammon. we're excited i can't wait <laughs> i, I want to read to you the opening of the Cunnilingus, the cut the book of Cunnilingus by sir richard burton and again remember he's taking all of these sources this person commands the sources like you wouldn't believe that's that's the value right this person is just extremely extremely well exposed right to these texts and he says to cause a woman to feel the venereal spasm by the play of the tongue on her clitoris and in her vagina was a taste much in vogue among the greeks and the romans so in order for us to understand what's going on in these rites we have to understand what their practices when we call these temple practice is sexual when we say the porneia is there we have to know what um what they're talking about right these vir you mean these virgin priestesses are producing the water of life for these people and they're still virgins yes yes is it because of the abortifacients that they're using no it's not which they use right it's because of the acts that you don't realize that they're committing when you talk about temple prostitutes, we're talking about people who are rendering up fluids for your sake, right? This, the whole act of that priestess is a part of this. You know, you guys were talking about spitting in the eyes and spitting in the mouth and treating disease just like Jesus, right? Spitting and licking and, you know, eyeball stuff going on, right? What's all that? Um, well, it turns out that the um classical world developed from a what we call a bronze age where they pioneered a lot of drugs that they filtered through humans and so that ejaculate is a medicine right that urine is a medicine that ordure is a medicine right those body fluids become medicines satan aka lucifer very famously scrapes his armpits why because he takes that sweat and he puts it into a concoction for eve and it makes her um exceptionally it's an aphrodisiac it makes her want him yeah it makes eve want the devil and you say i've never heard this it's because you know the apocryphal stuff the the as christianity took over the educate classical education um, they weeded this kind of thing out, right? We're going to support a certain um, view. If you want to call it a worldview, go ahead. I hate that term, but it, this is what they did. They, pr they push forward a view. And these things, these dirty texts, these things all get, all get uh, pushed aside. But if you will look, for example, at just the, at just the art of cunnilingus from antiquity, and how that you have sources portraying um this whether it's satirical and in mock or in jest or whether it's talking about the activities of cults right and um what kind of what kind of fluids and how to use them um nobody knows about this sexuality because guys like um burton here they couldn't he was a british knight too but he, even as a British knight, he couldn't um, give people this information. This stuff all had to be put off to a time when you and I could sit down. And even you and I, you know, just by saying the word clitoris, that we're um, encroaching on dangerous waters, right? That there's, yeah. this, there's this censorship out there. Um, yeah. I'll fear the AI, right? The algorithm. <laughs> Right, right. Um, so he gets into he gets into some debates about the language and how the language is being used, and he's very good at bringing you back down because he's a linguist. He's bringing you back down to that base evidence. Um, and if you go through, you're going to find things like the cup of Ganymede, and are they using it eventually to represent sodomy? Yes. They're eventually using it to represent sodomy. Is this what is going on in the rites? Remember that sodomy is not 
de-virginification, right? You still right. have, you still have a virgin, right? Because they're not stupid. They understand reproduction, right? And they understand that that's not a pathway, right? So, okay. Um, this is what we recommend for brides on the first night. Why? Because it makes things easier, right? Do you hear the, do you hear the very practical approach? This is the same thing they're doing with the medicines. And you guys are, you guys are touching on all of that and the whole symbolic bees and the beehive. It's yeah. What is it doing? Why are these oracular priestesses always associated with the use of honey? I can tell you from the just from the medical side that it's all over. There's there's different honey com, um, compounds, right? Like melicrat, right? There's milk and honey, right? What do you do? You make a mixture of milk and honey, and then that's a base for other drugs that you'll add to that. So yeah, yeah. that whole mel honey. melicraton is an anti pharmacion. That's what I came across. Anti pharmacos if that's the word correctly, it's, it's used the, as a base for snake bites. Wild. And, and a lot of people question, a lot of people question, like I talked to, spent a long time with John Scarborough, um, and it looks like a lot of the materials that they're using, like for, the, for example, the honey, right? We all know it's a preservative at that time because um, you know, you can preserve a body with this stuff. They did it with Alexander, right? Um, what do we know from the actual substances that they were using? They're mostly bacteriostatic, right? Um, honey is an environment that bacteria cannot grow in or do not grow in. Um, so um, the fung the fungal, the fu uh, excuse me, the fungal infections and that kind of thing, you know, when that tree, when that tree it gets injured and exudes that sap that sap is just an an immune response to prevent any fungi that are in the air from being able to grow and cause to kill the tree so we know we've observed these things over millennia and we know that you can take that substance then because it is a natural defense of the body it's a natural um, warder off of things. And you can use that. Next thing you know, everybody's using pine resin, right? Everybody's using pine resin. Oh, along with the bees, as long as bees, they like it. And then yeah. they would use Galen talked about that. Yeah. You can even make drinks out of it, right? I mean, they, they make one in Greece still today called Retsina. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, which is very pleasant. I've had it. It's very pleasant. It's like a, it's like a low-level euphoria, you know, really subtle kind of pleasant euphoria. Um, this also connects to that um, self-mummification we see because in the Asian traditions, you'll see them ingesting honey as well as these pine resins and these barks in order to enter into a state of death where their bodies then are preserved as mummies. And you can still see them to this day, you know? You know, I have an extra picture of them. If, right, if I'll bring that up. Bring it up here. <clears throat> right here. It's about a boy in the middle in the middle of the morning who runs away from a cohort of Roman soldiers at a garden. And what this what this artist has done, he's pointed us in a certain direction. All right, and it deals with what I believe was happening in the garden was teaching somebody the mysteries up all night deals with circumcision. There was some circumcision happening that night before Passover because before you could ever celebrate Passover with this crew, you had to be circumcised. And we know somebody was being taught mysteries all night before Passover. And there was a mikveh there to do submersion for that reason. But what the author, what the artist has done is pointed to send on in a certain direction. And a honey colored sindon at that, which is honeys are used for in sindons for circumcision, for snake bites, for wound care. So, does the artist know that the sindon was honey colored? And if it was crocus colored, then that'd be a symbol of the Nari priestesses, the male drones, because a lot of the, the Nari 
paintings, they'll, they'll have a crocus colored robes on. And so if the boy in the garden was wearing a crocus or honey colored sindon, that points to a circumcision being taken place before Passover. Uh, just putting that out there. And we know what happens with circumcision traditionally, what you do at the end of it to clean off the wound and, you know, different things. And also I consulted a pediatric clinic. So when you do a circumcision on an adult or even a boy from 12 years old on up that wasn't circumcised, because they were doing that because they had to circumcise the certain slaves and, and people that had joined the cult to learn the mysteries. If you're an adult, it says you have to masturbate or you have to have sex before the circumcision for a certain flaccidity to take place. And so based on all this, I'm seeing something happen here. I'm seeing a ritual circumcision before Passover. And it does involve sexual activities and herbs. I also want to remind everyone that there's the, the sacred function of the moil in traditional uh, Jewish uh, circumcision, where the, the moil priest bites off <laughs> the, 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 the foreskin. It's not simply a cutting of the foreskin. It has to involve the mouth. And what do you preserve it in afterwards? Honey. Yeah, you can, you can, I've seen those things offered up too. You can offer them up. Um, I saw Galen repairing them. He was on, he was on the end of repairing circumcision, um, which is kind of weird. You never see that side of it. Like somebody who got into it and then decided, whoa, <laughs> I don't want this. No, they had a remember. whole treatise on that in ancient times on how to repair your circumcision. Yeah. yeah. They, and, and they would he, wear that thing with the kino, um, it's like a strap that they would it would hold the penis up with the leather strap and it what it means is a dog leash dog a kind leash. of <laughs> yeah it's a dog leash and because you're not supposed to show your tip yeah. and if you were circumcised they would try to repair it yeah. and that's what a lot of deals with those rituals and part it of repairing like it deals with honey honey is what like it, repair it it looks like it was a status thing too um um because you know, everybody is bathing together in Rome, right? Not men and women, but men and men. And so when you're out there showing your parts to everybody, you're going to expose, you know, what kind of group you're a part of. And so I think that's why it's, it becomes more like status thing. People trying to get it back because they, they lose status. Circumcised people lost status. You know, so I don't know. And, and it's almost uh, contemptual, contemptually or co with contempt that he that he addresses it. So um, what about this, Dion? I'm thinking about your your proposal with that scene down being used in that process of circumcision. It, what you know, if we're at the crime scene and we're trying to re reestablish what happened for a court to be able to see it. Um, what does the evidence show um, about what that procedure was of that kid? Could it have been a circumcision? Yeah, that's within that's within the you know um, neighborhood. Um, you do have Jesus. Um, my question to you would be: When you're talking to Jesus, the guy always bursts into this castration stuff, right? He's he's always talking about for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. If that kid there is being put through the mystery. Like it says in pseudo Clement that he's doing with the other kid in the other cemetery who's naked and he ends up staying with and being flesh on flesh with. If he's doing the same thing to him, could it, could how much, which one is more? What do you think we're going to can the jury? Well, here, here, I got the answer for that. You're circumcised for Jehovah, are you mm -hmm. castrated for the goddess? Yeah, which one it's, is it's, he doing? it's a matter of length. How far do we go? How much you want to take off of the haircut? Just the tip? <laughs> how much do you want off? Right. <laughs> yeah, it makes me wonder though, which one is he doing it for? Is he doing it for that hoopsie stays, that highest God? Or is he doing it for the great mother? You know, is it possible that Jesus is doing those same castrations that the Baptists are doing? You know, it's kind of like, oh, wow, he does say 
you know, Paul does say we're baptized into Moses, right? So, wow. And nobody's, nobody was shocked. Did anybody notice there was somebody who was talking about a um, great discovery of a baptistry, of a Jewish baptistry, right? A baptistry. What, what, well, nobody cares about this. The, the same thing is going on, that they're performing these same rites, right? Yeah, it's, it's a weird history. But I want to know, Dion, which one? Which one is it? Is he castrating that kid or is he circumcising him? You know what I mean? Is that like, what's going to really get that crowd going? Because in notice, and I don't, I don't want to scoop myself because this is my own material I'm going to be using Wednesday. But um, I'll throw it out there because it's totally pertinent. N um, Nonus, who's rewriting the Gospel of John, says that when Jesus is before um, the religious authorities, when he's on his way to Pilate, that when they're asking him questions, his first response is, I am not in any way engaged in a lace-dace enterprise. Peter, Nonus says, Peter, who, uh, Nonus says Peter, at, at the time that he's identified, says, I am not in a money-making enterprise with him. <laughs> and it's really well, weird. It's like, wait a minute. What? That would lend that the, that the Sindon being crocus colored is a Castanari. Yeah. And the young boy would be sold yeah. in the Lestis pipeline, that's taken up I, to Tarsus or whatever and triple the value. Yeah, that's what I think too. And I think that's what the jury will say is the, you know, is the simplest explanation. If he was just doing a circumcision, I don't know that they would make such a big deal. And he wouldn't have had to say, look, I'm not one of these organized crime dudes right um, it's, it's not my thing um but the fact that he's there and the fact that they identify peter as a it's not co-conspirator it's like pro um somebody who's you know you've caught the boss and now you're getting the financial the accountants and whatnot that allowed the boss to be able to Rip on this off. rock, I build my church. What is yeah. his church? <laughs> right? Well, <laughs> they, sent a cohort? they sent a cohort to get him? Right. <laughs> it's like a SWAT team, man. People don't get it. That's a, They sent a SWAT team after Jesus. It wasn't a couple of guys, and you know, they just sent out a, from a 911. Judas is calling in, and they sent out a, you know, a couple of cops. They didn't do that. They sent out a SWAT team. To a thousand deep? I thought a cohort is a thousand. It's no, it's going to depend on the number, and it's uh, um, it's not the entire cohort. Um, I've seen somebody argue this as well, and I checked it out, and it's the word, and I can't remember it right now, but it's the word for a locally stationed. Um, it's like a detachment. So, did it necessarily have as many as a cohort would? I don't. I don't know the numbers, to be honest, but I don't. When I looked it up, I thought, no, it doesn't have to be. It, it's not. Oh the, ar oh, the argument was he sent the entire thing. That's what it was. Um, he sent the entire unit, right? Um, but the problem is um, it just says the unit. It doesn't right. say pawn. There's no, there's no adjective to identify. It's the whole group. So it just says he sent the unit. So I don't know. It could be the whole group. If it's as many as a cohort, then fine. But after, whatever that, after some young boys, huh? Yeah. After that, right. Right. But whatever that particular unit was that was in charge of that area from the Roman government, it's that SWAT unit that went out, right? Who knows how many of them they sent? I'm not convinced that it was, in, you know, it was um, several hundred you know, s soldiers. I'm just not convinced, but it was a, not a regular, you know, this wasn't a, you wouldn't take a thief this way, right? Some dude who stole something in the market, you're not going to take him down like this. This is a big group and they're using heavy weapons. Right? I keep thinking too of the gospel of Judas, where Judas is explicit about this, where he says that Jesus is abusing him and he goes to the Roman authorities as a direct result. <laughs> and then he's celebrated. You know, it's like there's there's a lot to unpack there. Notice, too, that, it, that um, Judas takes them 
to the grotto, right? Judas takes him to a place that is traditionally associated with the activity of trafficking, you know, organized crime groups so that are involved in prostitution. So it's no wonder that Peter is there right, right off the bat denying. I've always wondered that. Why is Peter denying his association? Nonus puts in the, in the mouth of Peter. And people will say, well, it doesn't matter because it's Nonus and it's later than the Gospels, right? That's the typical kind of Christian response, Judeo-Christian seminarian type response. Right? This is what some monk would give you from 1380 or something, right? Well, it doesn't matter because that, all that stuff came later. No, no, no. It shows us as scientists, as historians, it shows us that they viewed in antiquity Peter's actions as being somehow involved with an exchange of, of, of goods, goods and services. So Peter is a prostitute. And all he's doing when he denies it, he's not saying, no, it's not the cry. He, he's not the Christ. And we, that's what we take into the fairy tale. He's not the Christ. I deny him and cock-a-doodle-doo. And oh, no. He's, in Nonus's words, he's standing there denying the fact that he is tied up with Jesus in an economic enterprise. Right. So it's really weird. And Jesus comes out and says it again. He doesn't say directly, I'm not a lay state, so I'll show you on Wednesday. He says, I'm not involved in this kind of enterprise at all. Right? <laughs> so. We got to remember, too, about Nonus. Nonus is a master of the mystery rites. He speaks the, the Homeric Greek, right? And it's very important. Like if He knows all of this stuff on both the Greek and Christian sides. He's he's kind of our last person who's able to walk between these two worlds who writes on this. And he gets a lot of flack in modern scholarship needlessly. And it's silly. I'll never forget until like in my humanities degree, they were like, oh, don't go to don't go to notice for authentic Greek mystery because he's fifth century. And then I'm talking to you and you're like, he may be fifth century, but he's using the Orphic Vox and no one else is. Not at that time. Yeah, and he has an incredible education. And you can't forget that. You know, you can you can talk about the Christians destroying classical education, which they did, just like Julian predicted. But in their stupidity, they preserve certain things for us that we could then piece together later and say, oh, OK. And when you look, when you actually critically look at Nonus, because at the time and following, they did, people didn't know what to do with Nonus. Right here's this guy, a supposed Christian, who has the, who ha, uh, um, who's able to write like a pagan from a thousand years ago. Right, it's, it's weird. It's kind of strange. Well, he's so well. He's like an Alexandrian scholar in the Hellenistic period. Right, he's so well educated. He's so erudite. He's so well exposed to these sources that um that we can use him to kind of reconstruct earlier periods um, a lot of our sources that we have that kind of thing they're hidden right they're fragmentary somebody's quoting like none of these none of these erotic writers that i was naming you and gave you one or two none of them survives none of them survives you may find their influence or quotes in other works Nonus is one of these people who's absorbing and he's he's kind of recreating this this um, prophetic literature, and uh, it's 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 uh, it's not a matter of the fact that he's later and he's going to say something that contradicts what your perception of Jesus and his people were. It's the fact that in his in his writing he uses terminology that shed light on what the people in antiquity thought. Jesus was all about. When you think to yourself, that crowd of people that came to destroy Jesus, right? That crowd of people. When you see Peter right there getting ready at the front gate, getting ready to go in, and that, that steward has to come back out and has to take him back in, and she says, you're one of his. You're one of his. And he says, no, I'm not. All of those circumstances um, show us something of the reality that happened. And it looks like from the crowd that was raised and from the way that he was treated 
Jesus and his people that they just took him for a, you know, an, another one of these um, crime bosses who's um, controlling childhood prostitution. And he's, he's based in Galilee, right? He's just, he's got, he's got his voice from Galilee. Galilee, Galloy, Galahad. That's all I got to say about this. Okay. All of these virginal night figures who sacrifice their, you know, anyway, wild stuff. But also, like, what's more likely, right? Are the Jewish people all united under some elitist um, Sephardic kind of priesthood that's dictating to them to, to, to kill the son of God? Or do they think that he's actually abused children? Why would the, the Jewish populace let a murderer go, okay, and, 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 uh, and go after Jesus? The, the, the a normal person is not going to care if you're just a religious leader or even if you're a political leader, right? Like these people are not united politically, but you know what upsets people and gets them riled up? Child abuse. And you see this across history. Like, come on. So, so what you're saying is it's the, it's the, the weight of the charges against the person that they let go must point you to what the charges were to the person that they didn't let go. You know? Yeah, and I yeah, and I think I I mean I hear that's what Snappy is saying. Um, but I think that that's amplified by the fact that he had his whole entry. You know, everybody talks about the entry into Jerusalem, right? This is the stuff that sparked all the trouble, right? Sparked all the trouble. He ends up in the night with these 12 kids, um, naked and washing their feet, doing some things that teaching the mystery and he ends up in a garden with one and he's yelling I, i'm not one of these lace days right i'm all of this is happening um in, in part because of that entry when he brings those kids into town um and makes a scene makes a ruckus in the temple and 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 um stops the activity the cult activity Right. He's he's putting a he, he's, he's doing something economic. Right. All of a sudden you realize, oh, shit, these temples are not just, you know, in antiquity, your temple is not just a monument. It's not just a place that you go and you right. There's all sorts of different functions. The, the healing temples are like hospitals. Right. I spent a shit ton of time. Excuse me, snap, snappy. I, um, it's OK. I didn't cause you any problem. I spent a ton of time. Um, looking at Galen and everything that he did in Pergamum, where his training was. And those temples, those medical schools that we would call them, medical schools, they are actively treating patients. So the temple is a practice. And if you think that people, you know, we get this because we're modern Judeo-Christian um, victims, right? We're, we're victims of this history where um, people go and they, see something and they hear some words and then they leave that's not what an ancient temple is it's not a greco-roman temple at all those temples are where certain things are happening some of them are strictly financial right some of them are strictly about um, record keeping right civic record keeping right where do they keep the treasury right which one of the temples keeps the um keeps us moving forward tax wise Right when the provinces are taxed, who's in charge of that? So there's a lot of there's a lot of different types of temples, and that temple in Jerusalem, it's it is the temple. So the locals are using it for not only the practice of the mystery, but for whatever um, ancillary um, activities they need, including financial stuff. So when Jesus starts denying the fact that he has any financial it makes interest. It makes me. Um, it makes me think that you know um, that crowd n knew that he was profiting off the kids. Those kids had to be gone, right? We the boys of Galilee had to disappear, right? And um, yeah, it's just uh, it's sad. It's sad at the same time. If you piece it together, you can see that that one that one strain though that's keeping us that keeps us on track is the all the chemistry and biology and you guys talking about the honey and producing that i can't tell you how many times that priestess is is 
portrayed as being that, you know, that virgin font of the water of life. And if you really knew the sex, sexual practices, what that pornea is, because Richard Burton is going to talk about it. He's going to give you, right? How do they view cunnilingus, right? Did you know that you're called a Phoenician? You get a reputation um, for cunnilingus? That they call you a Phoenician, right? It's not only just for the purple. It's also for the fact that this is a practice. This is a Phoenician practice. They make jokes about it in Rome. You must be from Carthage, right? You'd think, what does that mean? Is there, Are they making fun of them because they're hillbillies or less advanced, which is usually what the Romans are making fun of people for, right? Right. This is civilization versus non-civilization, right? And everybody knows those you know, people in Gaul. I mean, geez, you know, come on, man. They're one step. They're just one step in front of the wolves, right? This is how, this is how they're looking at it. Right. And they're they're talking about, um, you know, those the 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 Phoenician style. What is the Phoenician style? The reason it's so important is that's a communion. We don't have the concept of that today. The fact that a woman's ejaculate could be a communion. All right. The fact the fact that you would tailor somebody, cut off their testicles so that you can change their hormone profile over time to transform them. And that's how they refer to it. Transforming them. Um, all, all of these things are within their sexual mores that you don't understand. And the Christians were not brought to life in a vacuum. They come from this. And that's why Paul is always telling him, don't do this. It's why the young prostitute is screaming at Paul. It's why the two young prostitutes are screaming at Peter, right? And the crowd is pissed off. They don't want those boys around. The, that angry crowd that's pissed off in that whole thing, it's because of their presence. Jesus is just another lace days, man. He's, he's just pimping children. And, you know, right? we have to point out, though, how predominant this kind of Syriac tradition is of the Great Mother and this transformation. Elagabalus, the actual Roman emperor, undergoes the transformation and calls himself a woman. He castrates himself. This is well documented, right? This was the high priestess of the great mother Sibylle, right? Like, come on. And the Roman emperor. Like, it was everywhere. When they say that the Christian worship is the same thing as the love for Antinous, right? And that whole how people, how the pagans are worshiping Antinous, right? Um, it doesn't surprise people. Um, people need to know that Early Christianity is a pederastic cult. It is a cult that is all centered around grooming, rebirth. And uh, how are you going to bring somebody to rebirth, right? You're going to take them right off the street, which is what the Romans are putting people in jail for. You're going to take them right off the street. You're going to indoctrinate them in these ceremonies, right? And... <laughs> My God, man, the Christians start taking off and the, the Romans have the high ground. People don't realize the Romans had the high ground morally from the start. Christianity today claims that high moral ground. It claims that high moral ground. And then people read the Bible and they're like, what? <laughs> this is not the high moral ground because Christianity didn't have it. Right? The Romans had it. They were arresting Christians for abusing children. For and for incest parents. too, right? They were doing the same kind of incest rights that we see. And it's important too, like, it's not like this practice goes away, okay? It's not even hidden in the early Christian church. We were talking about this with St. Christopher. You highlight this with the Alexandrian rites in your book, Original Sin, right? You brought up John Scarborough. This is all in, the, even in the PGM, in that early transitory, in that transitory period where these magical texts are incorporating everything turning a, a child into an oracle this is well documented and well known and it's underground and seen as evil right the pie that i stay at. everybody if you really want to understand the origins of christianity you have to dig into um 
paiderastea. What is that? What is that thing that children do? Right? What is that dance that children do? Right? Then you say, wait a minute. Um, let's not talk about this because I'm getting sick in the stomach. Right? If you look at the history of the West and you see cultures like the Thessalians, right? And what they're doing, um, um, that old, old background from those Pulaskians comes up in, in through the language, into the art, the material art. And you can see that paiderastea, right? That um, pederasty that we call, if you don't factor that in, um, you're not going to understand a lot of different aspects of ancient cult. And I'm not talking about just what you would say, well, that's all pagan, right? That's all pagan. It's not that, no, no, no. We're talking what Christianity evolved from, right? And how it influenced Christianity. Um, the very fact, Snappy, I don't know. Um, I don't know what your viewers think. I don't know how this message can or can't get out there. I'll throw this question to you guys. Um, and by guys, Snappy, I call um, women Sorry. guys too. I, you know, it's just my thing. Um, it's a generic, <laughs> generic. So, um, but um, well, I'll throw it to you then. I'll throw the question to you. Um, how is it? You know, we, we view the apostles as adults, right? If we can't even see the reality that these people were children, right? Which some of the Christians do. You saw that video that they were talking about. Yeah, they're all young. The age is young. Um, how do we get it out there? Something so simple as, you know, the age of the apostles. They're children. Jesus is hanging around with kids all day. When he gets arrested, he's with naked kid. When he, you know, um, there are all sorts of accounts of him doing stuff with naked children and tombs and, oh, it's a necromancy thing. How do we, how do we, um, how do we convince oh, anyone, Snappy? We have to look and remind ourselves, like, the power of taboo and the power of, of what Christian culture has done, okay? As someone who's studied a lot of history and religion, it, this is seen everywhere across everything. Women are marginalized and removed, right? Queer people are marginalized and removed. Trans people are marginalized and removed. And it's not until the modern period where you have scholars who are women, who are queer, who are trans, going back that these are even being talked about because we have made these subjects so taboo and we've removed them from our entire culture that it's impossible for people to imagine this. And we've all been brought up with this. Our parents are largely Christian. Our families, our society is Christian. How can we imagine them doing the worst, greatest taboos? How can we even talk about this? Drugs are taboo. There's a special power in taking something and hiding it, occulting it, and removing it from any sort of dialogue. And then it's only people who have, have those experiences, who have that perception, that can even notice it because the rest of us are bound by our cultural limitations. You're like, it's, 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 it's really important that we, like, I want, like, we need more scholars from more different backgrounds to engage with this stuff because I bet you there's so much stuff that we haven't even seen yet because we're obscured by our perspective, by okay, the culture okay. we're raised in. Okay, let me say something about that. Um, we need more scholars to, to be able to look at this and to say, oh my God, I could not agree more. I couldn't agree more snappy. And guess what? I can't even get interviews <laughs> Right. If I say, if I give out a hint, I'm going to talk about something, you know, that's within this area of forbidden. And the Jesus with the naked boy is like the thing. Right. Even if I leave that out, though, right? people will ask me, you know, tone it down. Can you tone it down? No, I can't tone down the sources. You're going to get a really sarcastic letter back to you. Right? I can't tone down the sources. When it says that kid is naked, in Greek, it says gumnos twice. He is naked. I don't care how much flowy garment you want to put around him. It says twice in the Greek, he's naked. There's a naked kid with Jesus. And if we just look at the sources, you can see that different world, that world where, imagine a world where it is looked upon that a woman's ejaculation is a form of divine communion, that you can create a system 
based around her ability to ejaculate you a cure. That um, it's it's a I never thought I never thought. I mean, think about this: if a priestess can produce, you guys are talking about chemicals and bodies and pigeons, right? Doves, right? You're talking about animal husbandry in that sense, right? And with the with the plants and everything. Imagine they didn't go that far to stop with people, right? Imagine if you could produce, if one woman could produce a chemical that would say, I don't know, treat a disease that people were getting, okay? Whatever it was. If one woman could do that, and what you needed to do was to receive that ejaculate, and they'll do it for you in a ceremony, right where it's all controlled it's all it's a part of an old 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 right that we all do right and i can sign up yeah i, I want to be there for the for the uh, um rights of isis and you know next month i'm going over i'm gonna get initiated into osiris right there's a lot of this um or you just want to go to the healing temple right we don't think of it today as um um consuming or interacting with the ejaculate or body fluids of a woman is any kind of medical procedure. Nobody's going to accept that. I don't know, maybe somewhere in the air or something, they might have a different, you know, uh, take on it. But how do we bring that back? Because that's what allowed them, the very fact that they recognized, oh, you know, you can cure X, Y, and Z, and all she has to do, right? Even your depression. Don't worry, go to the temple, have an incubation. The next morning, you'll be fine. You will have had a vision that God will have come to you. You will have had a vision and you, you'll be healthy that God will show you how to heal yourself. But it, it, it's coming through these rites that people are protesting against because they involve sexuality. And all of a sudden, if we have industries in our first century society that hinge upon um, prostitution, what you and I call prostitution, acts of prostitution, you, you've got a demand. Who's going to produce the temple group? Who's going to bring the doves to the temple? Notice he's kicking out those who were selling the doves, right? Notice that's what it came down to, the ones who were selling the doves, right? Those Pleiades, love that those ones who were selling the doves. And so, um, you know, it's, it's no wonder that Jesus is standing there and saying, I'm not involved in the financial profiteering in this temple, right? It's got nothing to do. He's, he's right away, he's withdrawing. I got no territory here, right? <laughs> it's not me. And everybody's yelling out, kill him. What about the murderer? No, the murderer, let him go. He's pardoned. Kill him. Why? Because that's the very heart of what Judaism was doing in the temple. The guy was questioning the very practices of the God of Abraham right there, right there. And, hey, you can't do that. People are going to, we don't want your boys, right? We don't want your boys from Galilee. The, the, you know, you keep them, right? And they took him out and killed him, right? It's, uh, it's you know, it's sad that we as we as human beings venerate and worship and pour billions and billions and billions of dollars into a symbol that came from a dude who was basically a, a sophisticated drug pimp, you know, um, pimping. And you know those pimps. The pimps use the drugs, right? If she's under the influence of a drug, she's a lot more pliable, right? It's just it's the way it is. Um, yeah, love it. But you know, hey, if it's if you're gonna hear the voice of God, this is the way you gotta go. That's what the Telestarian is for. Or, um, you humans, knock, knock, knock. You have a history of junkiedom, and you think your Western civilization is is so distinguished and so you know pure. No, we as a people have come to life through the junkies it's the junkies that have gotten us there and if we don't bring her back we're, we're, we don't deserve a cure 
you know what i mean um some somewhere they're gonna figure this out in some laboratory and it'll be a it'll be a nobel prize i'm i'm i I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. This is the this is the new science, the coming of the new science. Love it. Oh yeah. Bee venoms, snake venoms. That's what we've been coming across in the medicinal abstracts. You know, they're <clears throat> it's the cuffs. The reason it takes time is because people are patenting this stuff. And they're trying to control it. And they're doing tests on it. So it takes a while to come out. But they already got the stuff patented. You know, and we're also, we got to remember a lot of this kind of human husbandry. This is so taboo to even talk about, but this is something that we see in the anthropological records across history in various different tribal groups and various different religious societies and various different castes. You know, this is not something that is uh, so extreme, even though it's become made this ridiculous, like this insane level of taboo in our modern times. And there's almost certainly a level of this even going on to this day behind the scenes, you know? I keep thinking about someone like Frank Herbert writing about this in Dune. What did he know? What was he hinting at? Like a lot of these people can't even talk about this in any way uh, in public. They have to use fiction. They have to use other forms because it's become this obscured thing because we're so viscerally uh, taught to hate and fear it. And for a certain extent, that's rightfully so. But now this kind of level of, of, of occulted knowledge has prevented us from seeing what's staring us right in the face, you know? And I think there's a, there's a way to bring this about through the, through the medicine. Um, if you can take a person, I mean, imagine what they're doing. They're messing with the hormone profile and the person they're giving them drugs that are going to alter um, what their growth and development is. But in the process, they're burning off their mortality. Um, is there some kind of action when you're eliciting a response that can only be described as genetic because they're taking a, you take a nine year old girl and for three years, you put her through a regimen where she is constantly exposed um, to this, these compounds, and she ends up developing into a very specific form that then can produce the, that life-giving water, that water of life. Is there something um, in, in our society that we can take, like the scientists can take, and they can say, look, me medicinally, what's happening? Um, are you doing something to her genes? Is this some kind of, you know, some kind of genetic form of medicine? Is it you know, it, it is, could this catapult us forward so that you take this person, you know, snakes don't get cancers, right? Snakes don't get, that's, they used to say that. I've heard uh, people say now it is possible. It can be induced, but they typically do not. What is it? What does it have to do? Is it something the snake is, is involved with producing? Is it something even, even um, you know, my snakes, my good friends, I've got four of them, very good friends, beautiful, beautiful, lovely individuals who are um, more attuned to the world than I am. And they produce a substance whenever they're molting that allows them to somehow refresh in their skin, right? To bring it back and to make it, and it smells like earth. It smells just like the smells that they'll describe in the priapeia, right? It's that earthy, there's something there. If I were to, if I were to be a Bronze Age person, I might, if I had the right exposures, I might lick a four-mentioned snake, you know, just to see what, just to see what happens when they're producing that. Um, what's it going to take for to get our people to step up and say, there's something medically going on um, with these societies that they're they're inducing certain states um you, you're not going to be able to bring this about in the united states the that'll never clear right it's got to go through the fda right mm. nobody but in a in a in a generation that is being com obliterated with cancers in a, in 60 percent of us as adults will have cancer 60 percent of us that's majority right um um is there something if that we can hearken back to 
that would allow us to approach the medicine in a different way so that we don't, um, it's not that we're not exposed to the carcinogens anymore. Is there some kind of pathway physically that we can induce that will allow us to be able to um, treat ourselves, that allow us to treat that, treat that cancer, right, that, that malgrowth? Is, is there something um, that, that is in the medicine that they were using right? That, to make these half viper. Can you take a girl who's nine years old and put her through this process? Um, these are serious questions, right? Because this is what they're doing. So if we're going to reproduce that medicine, which I think is absolutely essential, they, um, they're even so weird about it that they talk about transfusions. Transfusions. Can you believe they're performing transfusions? Supposedly, they have transfusions where they can put within you um, the proper blood to cause you to, um, to regenerate. And I know you're going to say, oh, that sounds, that sounds weird. Okay, right? Um, why are they putting so much emphasis on this? Why is this even something that people do? We, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't know all the friggin' drugs that they were using. Now we do. Now we do. Well, what about the medicine? Well, what are we going to see in the future? The discussions that you guys are having, and I'll stop because I'm on a friggin' podium, but this, the discussions that you guys um, are making are paving the way for something very concrete. Um, this mystery that they perform in antiquity, it's not a faith. It's a thing. It's an operation that we could somehow, you know, maybe in a foreign country, Right, maybe somewhere we where we don't have the FDA looking over our shoulders, maybe somewhere where the indigenous people can um, can say, "Hey, you're not just whistling Dixie, right? This is you know this is part of our history as well." But we're going to have to think our way around that Christian um, refusal to embrace anything that you know has to do with sex or nature. Right. We're going to have to bring back Aphrodite until there are temples where I can be cured by performing Cunnilingus. Um, you know, we're not going to it's it's not going to come back. I'm afraid. Question for you, Ahmed. Will you get a purple ring? What do I think of purple rain? No, if you went to, if you no, not purple rain from Prince, <laughs> but if you went to this temple to perform this this uh, magical operation, would you end up with the purple ring around your face? Yeah, yeah, it, right. Or other places, right? You could get it on the other end. Yeah, you get your purple well, ring, just just like the Crusaders get, right? Who are recognizing Baphomet? Um, yeah, would you have a purple ring? They call them Phoenicians. They call them the Phoenician dogs. Why do they call these these boys Phoenician dogs? They're Heracles boys. Right? Think of Jesus with his boys of Galilee. Okay, on, on this side of the fence, we've got Heracles with his young boys, who he calls the Phoenician dogs. And why does he call them that? Their mouths are covered, covered with the stain. They even made fun of, um, they joined the, the process of cunnilingus with the action of the dog because everybody knows that a dog will lick you, right? A dog will lick you and bring that, bring that um, joy, right? That embrace of the dog. They compared that to cunnilingus. Now think about it. When you and I think of cunnilingus, we know, oh, no, that door is forbidden. It's closed. Don't talk about cunnilingus. Right. Um, it's forbidden. What if that garden is made open? Right. What if that if you have institutions that are performing what you and I call prostitution in order to heal, um, you know, you're you're bringing back that classical civilization They you say, oh, my God, it's terrible. No. What if you can heal your people this way? What if your people who are maniacs who are killing each other? right? And having all sorts of what you might call psychic or mental problems, right? And just your society's ready to rip itself apart. If you have healing centers, you can take this stuff out of people's brains, right? How many people, how many, how many people who are in that mode of that frenzy and they just want to tear down, how many of them would be helped 
if we can get on board on them a drug that allows them to go into that mania and to come back to a place of health. And guess what? They're given it by what is the most beautiful of creation. They're given it by that ideal feminine, that ideal feminine power, right? And what do the Galois do? Snappy, you know. What, why are we cutting off our testicles as Galois? Because we are transforming into that sacred image. You want to become a son of God? You want to become the one who's serving the kingdom of heaven? You become one with her, right? You're, anybody's transformation into her form is a religious practice. When Christians stand up today and they say, we're going to have the third guy to the president, we're going to tell you, you can't do this, these transitions you can't do, that is the repression of a religious expression from antiquity, from the very heart of human civilization. That comes forward. So, um, I, I uh, yeah. there's so many of these of these priestesses. There's you know there's the Inari, the Galloi, the Hydra. They're all over the world. They're all over the Mediterranean. But anywhere the Abrahamic religions went, they oppressed and destroyed them. And they've hidden this kind of thing, you know, and it's coming back because we're seeing this, we're seeing this flipping of the poles, we're seeing this evolution, we're seeing the rise and return of the feminine that had been so put under heel and not allowed to speak for so long. But these are natural rights. And they go oh, in both yeah. directions too. We even see women becoming men, right? Like the Scythian warriors or the Norse warriors. Like this is something that people were engaged in, these transformations. And this is about drawing down the goddess or the god. It's about in becoming possessed, divine imitation, that imitatio, or in the Indian, it's taking on the bow, the mood of the goddess. This is something you see so well represented in so many different texts. And it's like just hidden under the shoulder, the Hare Krishnas, okay? The Godaya Vishnavite tradition, the largest Vaishnavite tradition, worshipers of Vishnu, their founder, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, becomes a woman. He becomes possessed by the mood of Radha and he writhes on the ground in ecstasy and in love for Krishna. Not, not this platonic love, but a lusting love of a young woman for her partner. This is, you know, and this is not taboo. Ramakrishna does the same thing, right? This is something we see so freaking often. It's ridiculous. You were talking before about oysters. You guys were both talking about that oysters. And I was just translating today a passage. Somebody, one of my students was translating it for everybody else in the reading group. And he was looking at um, Io, who is going through that estrus. And she says, he pu pulled out this line, gorgeous. She says, I'm some kind of oysters, some kind of madness is Christing me. And she's in that sway of Aphrodite. What is Io? She's the cow in estrus, right? She is that form in estrus. Zeus has transformed her into that cow. She's constantly being watched this maddening Argus is watching her. This Alma is watching her and she is in that estrus stage, right? She's the priestess. She is the oracular priestess. Um, and it, it, what's amazing is people don't, you know, you think today, and I know this is going to sound like science fiction, but today or fantasy today, we have one class of person. We just have us humans right? One class. They're not looking at it that way in antiquity, right? They're producing another. They're taking, it's almost like they said, this is our base. But from this, using nature, you can make something that's purpose, that is fate. You can bring that forward in time. And what does it end up being? It ends up being that gynomorph right? That is that dual form. And, and nobody appreciates that today. We don't have, um, we don't have gynomorphs who are oracular today. Um, we persecute these people who go through this change, right? We persecute as something bad. If these people could be guided by a knowledgeable source, 
that energy can be directed. And in antiquity, it ended up being oracular temples. And we worship the great mother. And you say to yourself, there's a sexual relationship between Addis and the great mother, right? And this, right? And because we bump up against the Christianity, right? If you can take and turn a 12 year old girl into a dispenser of a cancer cure, right? Everybody backs off and they say, oh my God, no. Right? Oh my God, no, because of that Christian background. In antiquity, they would have said, what are you talking about? We got Pythias all over the place. Right? Go, go find the Pythia. The one thing I will say is we don't have the high cancer rate in antiquity that we do now. They did have it. It is way, way, way. And I'm telling you, I studied the medicine. It's my area. It is way, way, way less common than it is today. It is a minority. It's an oddity in antiquity. It's not a regularity. And it makes me wonder. Now, John Scarborough said, you know, it's probably because of all the industrial pollutants that we've got now. This is post-industrial stuff. They just didn't have the rate. That's possible. But they are over and over and over again talking about drugs, compounds that can be used to treat cancers. So, you know, somebody needs to look into this. If we have to produce a 12-year-old queen who ends up bringing us the medicine that, that cures the people, um, I, don't see, I, don't see why, I don't see why that can't be pursued. Wouldn't you want to be? Wouldn't you want to be a Medusa? How many people out there would want to be a Medusa if they could be? Right. This is the thing. You'll find people will line up, okay? And I imagine, like, with our modern science and our modern conceptions, we can refine this even more. We can expand upon the knowledge of what these ancients are doing. We don't have to do it the exact way they were doing it. We can bring this forward into modernity, which brings us to our next week's episode, which is going to be really awesome, because we're going to be having Dr. Daphne, who is a geneticist, and we're going to have Dr. Matthew T., who is a neurologist. And they're going to join, hopefully, if Ammon's feeling up to it, well, fingers crossed, he's been under a lot of stress, but we'll have potentially the three of them all talking together, you know, with different medical backgrounds, Ammon with classic medicine and bacteriology. And we're going to hash some of this stuff out with the most radical of the medicine outside of the human medicine that we see from the husbandry, which will be our last episode, the venoms. Because this is something that when people hear about the venoms, they, they balk, they freak out. How can people be ingesting these venoms and get anything out of it? Well, we're going to bring in the medical doctors so that we can hash this out. <laughs> I, had a, I had a student who's a friend um, just talk to somebody who's, a, who's like biochemist slash pharmacology. And so he presented him with some of the things that they're doing in the cult. And he said he's open-minded, but he's never heard of this kind of form of treatment. You just said swallowed them, right? They're putting them in the buttocks, right? They're getting them into your system in ways that aren't just, you know, because they know they have to circumvent the digestion. They're getting them into the eyes. They're getting them into the skin through, through slits. And so this is beyond what a biochemist or a pharmacologist somebody with a lab, their mind is going to be naturally, it's got a ceiling to it, right? Right. All I got to, all I have to do is say they're using the human body to dispense drugs. That alone is totally unpioneered. Think about that. Making a person a drug dispenser, not just using the drugs, right? We talk about one or two drugs here. Imagine we shotgun somebody with a whole series of drugs in a whole regimen in order to develop their body into the cup of the Eucharist. That cup, that, per, that person, you're talking about Ganymede, that cup becomes the dispensary. And it's not me making this up. It's ancient authors right, um, who are telling us uh, Medea's body becomes the cup, right? Her culpos produces that substance that makes Jason invulnerable and she gives it to him. They have a whole scene of her and it says very carefully how she takes her robes, pulls them up, goes into her culpos for that drug and then proceeds to put it all over his body and every orifice that he's got. 
she's putting that she's putting the sacred substance that's coming from her um i don't know how are we going to get some the i know how modern scientists think i did a whole degree in bacteriology i can tell you how modern bitch scientists think they will hear the value of this they'll know instinctively oh that's some biochemistry that we haven't you know we don't we're not playing with that on the pharmacy side um so they'll know the value of it but there's a ceiling there because in order to do this we have to make somebody produce the drug for us it's not going to be able to you know like you're saying snappy maybe they got cultures and labs and they can figure it out but you know the whole process you can't get this stuff unless it's an ejaculate that act of cunnilingus is sacred why is that act of cunnilingus sacred because it's only then that we can produce that water of life if she doesn't we got nothing right but like so, i'm interested to ask daphne like could we take a trans woman who underwent this in underwent transition before puberty with puberty blockers and whatnot who's never produced that kind of stuff would they have the right body chemistry even as an adult to be able to bring us this pornea could we do this right there are different ways we don't necessarily like i don't think we necessarily have to go back to children i think we can we can we can do this in a modern sense i do think it needs to come from a person as you're saying that's very clear but i don't think it would be hard to get a modern person to agree to this i mean you can you get modern people doing the most insane stuff all the time <laughs> well, what if we could use cell cultures right what if we can somehow construct a, a way of producing the very same experience and substance because remember she is sending you into a death state from which you're going to come back right so what is the what is the um um what is the mental like at, at what point in order to be blasted to the right place and you see this in the pgm in order to be blasted to the right place you have to be mentally set with specific images. What does that right involve that puts you into that place? There's a lot of art here. It's not just science. There's a lot of art here too. So we got to appreciate that side too. You know, um, yeah. Is there a chance that we can produce this in a laboratory? I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to make it that sterile. You know what I mean? I don't want it to be something that becomes, because you know what will happen. Pharmaceutical companies will figure out what the compounds are and they'll end up, you know, making a distribute, making it, turning it into a, what they had in the temple of Jerusalem. They're going to be buying and All selling. All I know is like here. a lot of us are psychonauts here and anyone who's engaged in that practice, like Dion can talk about this. You know, they're already turning people into drug machines already and ingesting the sexual and urine sexual fluids and urine this is this is done among consenting adults okay <laughs> they just ain't doing it for cancer cures yet that's the difference so you know, no, uh, but if i could i want to get the people out there to like subscribe share leave some comments if you if if in any way you uh you feel uh challenged by this information are you agree with this information that you've heard? Either way, you know, leave us your comments. We appreciate all feedback, you know. And like I said, we have an episode coming up, V for Venom, doing with snakes and how we interact with snake venom and doctors. And then after that, we got another episode coming up about the aqua vitae, the water of life. You know, that's eventually you're all going to want it because you we're talking so much about it today. You're going to want to get more into the, the alchemical formulas of it. And we'll tell you how it's done. The skeins glands. Oh, the skeiny. You're setting up the skeiny. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's a theatrical performance. No, this is deals with the Keteret incense, the temple incense, a theatrical performance, and a sexual act, all producing the same chemical uh, structure. The gland. A, A, B extract going on inside the body in the corpus. So there's this gland. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I've heard rumor has it. There's this gland, the skenase gland, that um, is in an area that um, is equivalent in the male of something like a prostatic um, 
uh, something that stimulates a prostatic dump of fluid, right? Um, and there's, it's the equivalent on the female side um, is considered the skene, and it's that holy tent, right? It's that holy tent. My God, man, you're talking about some old technology, right? That telesterian, that tent that Moses sets up, that place where he can get the voice of God, um, we're implying that there's, a, at least linguistically, there's a connection to that. You know, because it's, it's, oh, God, it's the people who discovered it and what they're, those people. I'll tell you something. There's a, there's a, a professional mason who's tracking me down, trying to get the information out of that for that, to precisely for that, for the sake of that skene. What do you think about that? What do you think about well, that skene? It's a skiff. It parts the waters like a scalpel. Prostate-specific antigen. Some sugar, some salts in there, acetic acid and pentatonic acids, you know, and if the woman is aroused, there's extra chemicals that are that are released. You know, we're, we'll get into it And the burning purple, you know, is used. The molluscs were used in gynecological um, remedies with honey. So we're ultimately going to get there, right? If we can envision that, can't we? Can't we make it to that level? If we can see that skiff, right? If we can see that sacred temple, um, can we produce that, right? Can we, can we hearken back to have the real authentic practice? Can we bring that back? Uh, do you think, do you think they're doing that now? Kind of on the down low or at least are humans, are humans, Dion, trying to dig back into that soil that is the, that yep. is, the, yeah, the right. Yep, it's happening. It's naturally happening. It's in our DNA. It's in our subconscious. It's in our psyche. It's in the ethereal. It's just a natural human expression. Our relationship to the birds and bees, to each other, to nature, to animals. You know, we're imagine, living spirits. Imagine if there's a divine communion that comes through an ejaculation. Imagine if it's like the cure that's imprinted upon your brain, right? Is this natural thing that comes through. And somehow in order to get to that, we've got to have transitions. We've got to have transformations. We've got to bring out that technology. I'm telling you, they're going to tell you, they're going to say there was an alpha transition. In the future, they're going to look for an alpha transition where human beings finally in in 2026 um hit back upon the alpha and we were able to bring that transition that was made was the bridge for us to bring back that water of life to bring to take that next step evolutionarily to increase that lifespan right to have that to have that step forward to beat the cancers and to beat um, that which was, you know, um, um, the genetic, the genetic propensity to degrade into a tumor-filled, right, um, 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 death, right? What is it? Are we fighting against that? Is it that tree of life? It's got to be the tree of life. I think, I think. Um, we're just bringing back the tree of life. But if we can, how many people here in this in this response, you know, in the chat tonight, tell me to, to shout out if you would, if we could bring her back, would you um, would you want the cure? If we knew that it was a cure, we knew scientifically this is what it does, right? This is medicine, like the heart of medicine. Would you want to go back to Eden? Would you want Would you want to bring that back? Would you want Eve there? And all of a sudden, you're like, "What? We need Eve." Yeah, we need Eve. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, though, if you go back, remember Jesus refused the antidote. The you know, this is not an easy process. You have to enter unto death, my friends. You are going through a literal transition. You will be someone else on the other end of this. No one comes out unscathed, right? No one. <laughs> Is that a door song? <laughs> ah, 
Not intentionally. I think maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. That guy knew some stuff. <laughs> but everyone, like and subscribe. We have all of our links below. Go support Ammon at Lady Babylon 666. He is winding up his series, right? This is his novel, his free novel that he's giving to all of us about this stuff. And when it's over, it's over. It's okay? over. It's over. It's over. <laughs> we only have we only have six, seven more, five or four. Yeah, we've got we've only got a few more coming up. So three more satanic initiations, and I think four more of the Bible studies, and then we're done. That's everything. Um, it's not coming back, and I have no intention. I honestly have no idea where I'm going. All I know is that Omnia is coming out. There's um, an institution that's being built in order to bring back the museum. And um, the, um, I really appreciate the fact that people out there recognize the value of, of, you know, what's going on, the value of the work that's being done. So thank you for having me today. That's all I'll say for my, my bit, but um, Snappy and Dion, I can't, I can't um, give you an accurate depiction of, you know, the way that I feel about what you're doing. And none of it, none of it, Chewy too, and none of it. Not, people notice this isn't for greed. This isn't for the sake of any, no, none of us here is getting any richer on this stuff. No, I, I sure as hell not. I don't know. We got people stalking us. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, you like the stalking is good, though. It keeps you fresh, man. <laughs> Keep you on your toes, I'm telling you. No, this is nothing but love and inspiration. You help bring that inspiration, Ammon and Chewy, and for that we will be ever for great, ever grateful. You know, and this is what it is. Now it's the next phase. We're next phase we're preparing for the academy, the museum, and it only continues, people. So stay tuned, like and subscribe, support Ammon. Links are below. Peace, love, hail Satan, everyone. Any last words, Dion? Oh, just keep your head up, stay blessed. You know, the universe has special things for you, awaiting you. You just got to plug in. All right, everyone. Take care. Until next time, we'll see you with V for Venoms.